Hello and a warm welcome. My name is Peace Eyed and I am the West African correspondent and the head of digital media and partnerships for Forbes Africa. I'm sure you will agree that yesterday's jam-packed event left us so inspired with a lot to think and talk about. And it left so many of us hopeful for the future and excited about what we can achieve together as women. Now we're moving straight into the next panel discussion and this time the garage. WFH and the remote revolution for young African startups. Our moderator is the amazing Fifi Peters. Ian Williams is the head of marketing for Vuma. She is responsible for developing and managing the brand, marketing and CSI strategies and plans. She is passionate about the telecommunications sector, specifically its ability to enable digital inclusivity in the country. Olga Arara Kimani is the Global Head of International Communications and Regional Head of Corporate Affairs Brand and Marketing AME at Standard Chartered Bank. Her core responsibility covers the delivery of an integrated internal communication strategy to build a stronger employer brand. Salima Vizram is the founder of Samar and Solar Backpack in Tanzania. She launched the business in 2015. The carry bags have a built-in solar panel and battery pack that charge while walking to and from school. Emma Theophilus is a Namibian politician and lawyer. She is the youngest member of parliament in Namibia. She is currently the Deputy Minister of Information and Communication Technology. The moderator is CNBC Africa anchor Fifi Peters. Right, so let us get straight to it and good afternoon to you all. I'm really excited to hear uh, your thoughts on this very important discussion. And uh, Deputy Minister, if you allow me to challenge the protocol of uh, beginning with a government official just uh, for today, um, I will come to you. But I thought that it was a great place or it would be a great place for us to start to hear from an entrepreneur um, who may have had to go back to the drawing board uh, to kick this discussion off. And Salima, um, I'm coming to you now. I mean, your business uh, makes the most fabulous handbags out of apples and ocean waste plastics. I am told I uh, certainly I hope to uh, get myself one in, in a very short while. But talk to us about the impact that COVID-19 has had on your operation and whether you have had to go back to the drawing board and rethink how to merge your business um, a lot stronger in a post-COVID-19 world. Thanks so much for having me, Fifi. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's been a crazy year, I think, for everybody. And we've been in a place where it's really made us question what the future of work is going to look like, what the future of our business is going to look like. Um, and when COVID first started, we had just grown the company enough to be able to afford an office space. We had just signed a four month lease um, and we were getting ready to move into that space. And it was our first physical location um, because we had primarily been working from home out of our garages, out of our like living rooms. Um, and we had just pivoted to trying to be in a physical location. And we used the space for four days before we had to move everything back um, to work from home and back to our garages and so that has definitely kept us as nimble as we've ever been um but it's also made us realize how at, especially being in e-commerce we're extremely lucky to not have to worry about a lot of physical aspects of running a business that other companies have to think about um, and so I think that has been a huge blessing for us. And it's definitely just made us stay young, stay relevant and stay more connected to the consumer than we've ever been. So in my eyes, I feel extremely grateful that we have this opportunity to be online and to be um, digital in a time where it's really needed. I'd like to come to you, Olga. Um, I must say I thoroughly enjoyed the opinion piece that you wrote uh, in the Business Day as you were uh, reflecting on the latest Women in Technology initiative uh, by the bank, I think that was launched in Ghana. And um, in your piece, you did mention how small the uh, funding um, uh, pie or funding that was allocated to uh, women businesses, particularly women uh, businesses in, tech, in the tech space. So Olga, as you do reflect and tell the audience 
us a little bit more about the uh, the, the program that the bank does run. Um, can you perhaps also share your your, your thoughts on how COVID-19 has uh, impacted the funding landscape and whether you see a uh, change happening anytime soon? Um, unfortunately, and we shall have to start with that, the, the funding gap during COVID has unfortunately widened. In fact, recently, you know, Africa Development Bank sharing its update in 2020 is speaking of now an almost $46 billion, you know, gap uh, for women. But, but I think this also presents further opportunity for women to, you know, expand and explore. I heard, Salima, what you're saying as well in terms of, you know, trying to quickly become agile and nimble and shifting your business, you know, um, to do to do exactly that, you know, to mitigate some of the effects that the pandemic would have had. You know, we, we've also seen again across the continent, Fifi, that it's not for a lack of ideation. The women entrepreneurs actually across Africa are probably 60%. So they are much, much more, you know, that, than the men, whether we're talking about the garage businesses or the table businesses, you know, that our mothers previously probably would have um, started. The encouragement that we are trying to give is to ensure that there's a lot more women getting into that tech space or utilizing, you know, digital capability. Because I think that will be the only way that women actually get opportunity to expand, you know, their businesses so that you're moving just within the borders, you know, that you typically would have been confined with. Even in a COVID situation, we've seen that, you know, airlines that are part of the supply chain have continued to fly. They've continued to supply goods, you know, across the various continents and, and countries. Uh, but again, just bringing it, you know, to, to the pitch that you're talking about and where we realized that there was obviously a big issue that we needed to do something about. We are getting into, for example, in Kenya, our fifth cohort uh, for the women in technology, which now continues, you know, to get recognition. We have eight of these programs, you know, across the world, having started in New York in 2014. Uh, most of these young women now coming through, I think, completely recognize that if you don't have a digital integration if you're not used, utilizing mobile telephony, especially for us, you know, across Africa, then it means increasingly you get left behind. You don't necessarily get the interest of a lot of the, the organizations, whether it's private equity, you know, venture capital funds that would want to get in there. Uh, we are cautious at a bank as well that we're not just pushing for that digital part of it because a lot of people, again, would be seeing it as being a fad but that these young women obviously are coming up with ideas that would be sustainable where the digital infrastructure actually comes in to support and make sure that, you know, they can grow um, as a business. Deputy Minister Emma, if, if I could come to you now, uh, congratulations on your appointment. But of course, you were appointed at uh, perhaps one of the uh, trickiest times to be um, elevated to a position of power, being just a week after the coronavirus hit the shores of Namibia. Uh, with that, you had to hit the ground running, and especially with your portfolio being so critical to uh, getting a lot of, of, of companies, a lot of women-led companies and a lot of uh, tech startups up and running and on their feet. So just talk to us about the, inter the interventions that your government has on the go, the plans that you currently have on the go to try and do just that. Yes, that is true. Um, it's been a roller coaster um, trying to keep businesses afloat. Um, the government... Um, multiple times have uh, issued uh, assistance to small, media, micro entrepreneurs to ensure that they're able to, one, uh, pay their employees, um, negotiated with the Bank of Namibia to, of course, reduce the repo rate so that um, the amount of loans they need to pay back um, are either put on hold or they're severely uh, reduced. Um, another would be, of course, the way the business um, uh, sort of adapted because if there's one thing this pandemic has taught us is that it is it has taught us to uh, adapt it has taught us to reinvent be creative and have digital transformation so many businesses um, were supported in ensuring that one they have access to online platforms through our Namibia trade forum and our Ministry of Industrialization and Trade to be able to continue business activities I can give one stark example um, the women uh, during the lockdown who sell on the side of the road, whether it's fruits or, or, or traditional garments and so on, uh, could not do that anymore at a time when there's curfew, for example, or in a time where people were discouraged from being on, on, on the streets because of, of the pandemic. So 
a lot of them were then connected through either USSD or through WhatsApp and Facebook platforms to be able to continuously sell their products and linked up with transportation services companies to be able to transport their, their, their products uh, either from the home or their living room or garage to their customers. So those interventions, I think, um, of course, did not allow every single business to be saved and every entrepreneur to be saved. But I think um, they were able across the board to assist both tech companies and those that uh, practice in traditional uh, business. Thanks, Deputy Minister. And uh, we'll come uh, back to you in the next round as we talk about, you know, what else can be done uh, to ensure that more and more businesses are safe. But Leanne, the issue yes. of connectivity and fiber network providers, I mean, the whole world relied on companies like your, like Woma, for instance, to be able to proceed with a business unusual during this time to work, to learn, to shop, to live from home. Uh, with that said, yeah. though, I'd like to understand what kind of activity you are seeing on the ground as this panel is talking about businesses going back to the drawing board. What have you yeah. seen in the space by way of a lot of by way of companies, perhaps former clients who have had got who have had to go back to the garage or perhaps even new clients <coughs> who have uh, demanded some of your services as a result of having to start up again? Okay, so I don't think it's so much a case of having to start up. I do think it's a different way of work as people working remotely. There has definitely been an increase in demand for connectivity and quality and um, reliable connectivity. So it's not only the small and medium businesses that look for it. It's also the larger corporate guys who need connectivity to do their jobs from home. Um, from Vumital's perspective, um, we do position ourselves um, to, you know, our whole sort of mission statement is to allow or create the opportunity for ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And connectivity, we believe, is very, it's, it's core to that. So with the pandemic striking, I mean, there are a couple of things that, that have been hit. It's education, it's small businesses, it's large corporates, um, it's teachers, it's, it's a whole host of things. I think speaking to the youth, and I think it's created amazing opportunities for them to start businesses. Um, going online and going digital breaks down boundaries, it breaks down breaks down borders. And I think with the new and young diverse thinking that emerges, if you look at um, organizations like Girl Code, where they are focusing on young girls, teaching them how to code, um, taking away the fear that I think most youngsters have generally, not just girls, um, there is quite a lot of movement in that. Um, and then the other thing is, um, like I say, people just generally working from home, connectivity has become critical. Um, so while a lot of, we know that unemployment rates have increased, have soared, especially in the last quarter, we're looking at, I think, the highest unemployment rate since 2008. So um, I know we chatted briefly when we were preparing for this, uh, for this conversation, and one of the things that I did say was that um, connectivity is one thing, but there are a multitude of other factors that we need to take into consideration. So what is the content that people are accessing? What skills are being imparted from people who have had the luxury and the benefits of running successful businesses. E-commerce is scary for a lot of people, but if people who have done it in the past are willing to share their skills and knowledge, I think it creates more opportunity for our youth. And at Vuma, we actually focus on going back to grassroots. So we spend a lot of our time, money and efforts going into the school environment where we introduce digital and technology concepts to the youngsters and take away the fear because a lot of our, our youth, unfortunately, in our country and on our continent, and um, don't know how to utilize that, um, the, the technology that is, well, when it is available to them there, but if not, how do we help them get that? So we have things like content access, devices, so connectivity is one thing, but I, like I said, I always like to put it out into um, the public domain. I do think there's a fantastic opportunity, especially at this time where we are as a global community, to see how we can pull all our efforts together and make a more meaningful, impactful um, contribution, because we're all doing it in bits and pieces. Uh, Salima, coming back to you, you had already developed quite a, a strong footing in the online and the e-commerce space. Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, as we were trying to think about how we can make more impact, particularly in the area of startups for, for um, the tech sector here in Africa, um, what, what, what interventions or support uh, do you think we require at this level to, to do just that? But not only for the startups, perhaps even for existing players like yourself who are looking to scale up even further. Yeah, I think 
one thing is obviously access to funding, whether that's through venture capital or whether that's through um, debt financing. I think banks, I think the private sector has a huge role to play in that. Um, we know that less than 2% of all funding goes to women and female entrepreneurs. So I think that is a huge, huge area where whether the pandemic exists or not, I think that is something that is an extremely important thing to be cognizant of and just to talk about. Um, and then I think the other thing is to also support female entrepreneurs in other areas, whether it's e-commerce or not, because I think one of the biggest challenges we face, even though that even though we are established in the e-commerce industry and Sometimes we don't even have to touch our physical product, but between the time that it's actually produced and by the time it actually gets the, uh, to the customer. Um, the other thing is making sure that the infrastructure is there in place to support that e-commerce growth. And I think that's the challenge that we're facing right now where we have amazing growth on the e-commerce side, but the companies that exist that support us on the supply chain side, on the production side, on the packaging side, those are the companies that are also going to need a ton of support um, to support this, um, this growth in e-commerce in the move to being online. Um, and I'm really curious to see how um, the private sector specifically supports those type of companies as well, because I think e-commerce companies get a lot of... Um, attention at this time because it's amazing like I think we we haven't been able to connect to our customer better than we have in the last year and I think it's we've I personally have talked to friends way more I've talked to family that is across borders um way more than I ever have and it's the result of a pandemic which is which is the bright side of it right and so there are the, the connectivity and the the, what I think Vuma is doing is amazing because it's allowing people to be connected. But the other side of it is that the other industries have to scale at the same time to support the growth in e-commerce and in the connectivity that we need. All right, uh, Leanne, I mean, as um, uh, Salima just introduced you uh, there as uh, Vuma Tal, I perhaps want you to uh, uh, pick up from her thoughts here in the sense that, I mean, how do, how do, to answer your question, how do we pull together to make sure that our efforts are more impactful? And especially in the area of, of increasing the scale of connectivity on the continent. And by that, I'm referring specifically to uh, costing. I mean, for, for, for businesses who are, have been hit by the dry up of their cash flows, and yes, they need to go back to the garage and make sure that their offerings are more uh, digitally inclusive. But now they, they are perhaps dealing with the, the, the barrier of cost of these digital services. How, how, what would your advice to them be on addressing the issue of affordability? I mean, how do they get going with what they have? Look, at rolling out fiber, um, it is it is the best connectivity um, out there, without a doubt. Um, and I do think that, look, there's, there's no running away from it. Like I say, devices aren't cheap. And to get that connectivity, also, there's capital layout that is required. Um, I do think that the future benefits of growing a startup or starting something small and growing it into a bigger organization and scaling it uh, to scale, as you said, I, I do think the cost is worth it. Start small, start with what you need. And as your business grows, you can obviously increase your line speed, for example. So it's not putting yourself um, in, in a financial or a sticky financial situation. So you can grow your, your connectivity as required as your business grows. Um, then it's, a, it's an investment. Yes, it is a cost, but it, it is absolutely an investment. Um, just an example, we started, we, we, um, we've connected over 420 schools. If you take an average of five to 800 kids per school, I mean, you, you see how many families are impacted. So the kids may have connectivity at school. What happens when they go home is a different story. But if we all pull together, like I said, and we are doing it. I mean, Vodacom's doing it, Altron is doing it, MTN is doing it, we are doing it. Even people and companies outside of the um, telecoms industry is doing it. But I think putting that focus and working, co collaborating more to, towards that common goal, because we do share the same value and, and end goal. It's, it sounds really complicated. I don't think it necessarily is. I think the right conversations are being put out into market. Um, our primary goal as a country should be, and an industry should be, 
how do we get our people connected? How do we create more opportunities? And that initial outlay, that initial cost, I don't think um, will impede anybody in the growth of, of, of small businesses. Uh, Deputy Minister, if uh, perhaps you can come in here in terms of answering that question on how we uh, get more people and more businesses connected. So as you are, are looking to increase connectivity for uh, young uh, uh, Namibians and uh, also weighing in on how to scale that up before the young people at large on the continent, um, w w what are your plans here? Talk to us about what you have on the table. Well, I think uh, I, I can agree with that. Uh, sound policies, political determination and transform transformational leadership around digital literacy and connectivity is quite important here. Um, governments on the continent need to improve and update legislation. Namibia, for example, is now working on a cybersecurity uh, act um, after we passed our Electronic Transactions Act uh, to try to complement the, the great demand for connectivity and more and more people going online. We are also uh, working towards our Data Protection Act to ensure that this digital transformation comes, of course, with, with the privacy it deserves, um, private security, consumer protection um, of transactions and ICTs, so that more and more people do not become vulnerable as they are migrating more and more online because this pandemic has, of course, um, sort of accelerated how uh, we now inter interact online. So all of this really we're trying to, to try to sort out now so that, um, the, for example, payment interest infrastructure for trade um, actually improves so that there is no uh, risks to, to businesses and small, medium enterprises or young entrepreneurs being uh, at risk as they as they are migrating their businesses online. So I do agree with the, with the triple P's, especially sound policies that are able to respond to an ever-changing technological landscape and space so that more and more people feel confident in operating on the online space. Olga, as we talk about trying to solve this problem, um, how, how, how do we get it to, uh, to you know, a more equitable level? Um, and perhaps I'd like um, you to respond from a viewpoint um, of the entrepreneurs who are coming to knock on your, your, your banks, um, or your doors as banks. I mean, what, uh, perhaps a checklist of how to ensure uh, their pitch um, is not declined and how to ensure that they are able to increase the the, the funding level that is directed towards their businesses, particularly those owned by women? Um, I, I think the same rules would apply for, for males and females. We don't really segregate. You know, we, we are very conscious that, you know, as a bank, we are core in our diversity and inclusion. I think for me, the bigger message would be that the females need to stop being shy. You, you would typically have to ensure that there's a strong business plan that you would come through. Our women in tech program typically looks at ideas that we then take the females through an incubator, really train them, get them to understand what are those four aspects of what it is they need to cover to make them what I would call funding ready. So I think it's a lot more of women putting up their hands, you know, making, making sure that they're getting exposure to that. We, we tend to find that men tend to be a little bit more detailed. They would go out and do a little bit more research any banking institution will expect to see that anything that they are funding, again, as I said earlier, uh, would be sustainable, you know, that it definitely has, you know, some legs and that will, even our funding, you know, will ensure that any capital injection that, you know, the business is going to, to grow. So I think women get excited. Um, I'm typically one of those. <laughs> My team makes fun of me. You know, it's research of one. I see something and I, I really love that. I think it would be a great idea. But I think it's just vesting um, a little bit more time. Uh, spending a bit more detail in that. So most of the women that we've seen doing a lot of that work, we've seen that their numbers typically get, go through the ringer um, a lot more easier, Fifi. So, so the work is on us um, as well would be the message. Thank you. Uh, Salima, just parting words from you for the audience members, particularly entrepreneurs who are looking for a little bit of hope in these very difficult times. Yeah, I think I loved what Olga said about just not being shy. And I think as women, we kind of just have to go out there and truly we can be whoever we want to be and we can do whatever we want to do. And there's nothing really that's stopping us most times apart from ourselves. And so I think now is the time to really just go all in on the things that you want to do and let nothing stop you in the way of that.
Fantastic. Uh, Deputy Minister Emma? Yes, I think, um, of course, the way business is happening now is dramatically changing because of the pandemic uh, and, of course, perpetuated by the fourth industrial revolution. But I think there are opportunities as much as there are challenges, and those opportunities uh, can be harnessed uh, by creating, of course, uh, an enabling environment uh, for all of those that are in this business space um, and governments working together with private sector in partnership to ensure that businesses survive and that they become better um, as we move forward in the way we do business and that we're able to support um, even institutions out of the business arena, whether it's schools, whether it's e-medical health and so on, to ensure that we all uh, go through this together. Uh, Olga. Um, thanks, Fifi. I think we've all mentioned, you know, how the whole uh, e-commerce space, you know, has really um, exploded. And I think, you know, the pandemic has driven that a lot more. Uh, my encouragement to female entrepreneurs is really take advantage of that. Once your business is in the e-commerce or the internet space, you know, it's agnostic. It doesn't know whether you're male or female, right? And, and so therefore nobody should be able to really you know, segregate or, you know, uh, come against you because you're a woman. I think really taking advantage of that, especially more so Africa in the Middle East, we see a lot more of the mobile, you know, explosion. Last but not least, Leanne. Okay. So I'm actually going to steal from Alec Wick's, um uh, interview yesterday where she said, we don't have to be a supermodel or a celebrity to use the platforms we have to make our voices heard and make a difference. Um, I think women should not shrink. It's our time to shine, grab it with both hands and run with it. Um, I just want to read something here because I don't want to get it wrong. Uh, from Vuma, we talk about empowering individuals who empower communities. And we know that when we empower communities, we empower society. And when we empower society, we build stronger and more inclusive economies. And I think if everybody plays their role, no matter how big or small, now is the time. Digital is now, and it is definitely the future. Now is the time for us to all stand up and make a difference, regardless of gender, race, or creed. It's, it's now. Now is the opportune time for us to get this thing moving and moving quickly. Uh, certainly. Um, I suppose we also don't have a choice, right? We certainly don't have a yeah. choice. Um, economic activity is, 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 is coming back, albeit slowly, and uh, we certainly do need to be thinking about how we forge ahead better and how we forge ahead stronger but ladies thank you so much for giving us your time this afternoon but i think the most striking point for me that were communicated by the panelists is is the sense of go in go go in for what you want and and go in all the way and certainly let nothing stop you of course you have to use the uh, the leverage that technology and innovation is 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 giving a lot of uh, businesses a lot of economies uh, to leapfrog some of their previous uh, developmental challenges and also the issue of boldness uh, being bold and knowing that eventually if you stay bold and you stay committed to uh, what it is that you believe in someone will believe in you and the rest will be history from there